So, um, thank you for coming. I'm, apart from recording this, I actually want to do something slightly different with this presentation. Um, I'm using you as guinea pigs. Um, and just to explain why, um, for those of you who may not know the school and the process, um, there's at the Australian Agricultural Business Economic Society conference, which is the conference we all go to each February, there's a very strict 16-minute um, time limit on presentations, at which point you get dragged off if you overrun. Um, at the one in February, there was a guy from LSE, Simon Dietz, who had a really interesting approach to this problem. He said, how can I present this paper in 16 minutes? That's impossible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present this paper in five minutes with three slides. So his, his approach to the constraint was to actually make it smaller. And he said, well, and then I'll give you the whole paper in the first five minutes, and then anything after that is bonus. As in all the discussion which may come after that is just sort of, is extra. And it worked quite well, and I thought well, that's quite an interesting way of doing this, rather than the usual process, which is where you're hammering through and then running the risk at the end of it, you uh, run out of time. So I thought I would actually try that model, even though we haven't got quite the same time constraints, I'm going to just experiment on you with this model of presentation. So I'm hoping to do this entire presentation in, I think, six slides in ten minutes is the target. Then I will keep on talking, uh, don't worry, um, <laughs> I'll keep on talking, but doing the elaboration. But what I hope to do is actually get us all the way through in terms of the, what we're trying to do and what the results are very quickly, and then there'll be elaboration. This may crash and burn dramatically, but we'll, we'll <laughs> let's, let's see what happens. So, um, what's this about? It's about um, marine offsets and this idea of social license to operate. It's um, work that's funded through the Marine NERP, the Marine Biodiversity Hub, and it involves me, Abby Rogers, who's in here, and Claire, who was a master's student from France who came in for hmm, five months and did a huge amount of work. So um, this is sort of building on her data set and her work. So, what are biodiversity offsets? Well, <coughs> they're actions that ensure there's no net loss following the development. Um, it's required at, you need to put in place a, uh, an offset if you've undertaken development. At the federal level, if there's an impact on what's known as a matter of national interest, so there's a list, all the endangered species and so on will be a matter of national interest, and it triggers, if, if your development impacts one of those, it triggers the requirement for an evaluation and possibly an offset. Proponents, the developers, are required to, to do things first. They have to, if they can, avoid damage. If they really can't avoid it, they have to mitigate it by actually changing the practices on the development site. And then, if you've still got some, evaluated to have some residual damage on a species or a matter of national interest, then you have to have an offset to actually try to bring you up to this idea of no net loss as a result of the development. Um, what's important about the offset is it happens somewhere else. It's not happening on the development site, because that would be avoid and mitigate, but you're doing something sort of off-site to try to overcome the problems. Lots of questions happening in the ecological <coughs> literature as to whether or not this is, uh, offsets are actually acceptable or appropriate, and those are questions about whether ecologically you can actually do this, as in can you actually claim you have no net impact ecologically by going and doing something somewhere else. So all sorts of questions being raised about that and about whether people actually do actually follow through, there's no mon or whether people are monitoring offsets properly, all those technical stuff. Um, we're going to put to one side actually, that's not the question we're interested in. What we're interested in is the idea of social acceptability. <coughs> so are people or society actually prepared to accept this idea of an offset in the ecological, these ecological settings? Not much work, there's lots of sort of social action happening there, but not in terms of much work, academic work on it. And what we're interested in is this idea that actually there's a number of ways that an offset could be achieved. You're moving off site, you have to achieve no net loss. There's potentially lots of ways you could do that. So does the way that the proponent is putting up the offset, does that change how, what's acceptable? Are they likely to, to, be, to view some um, mechanisms for achieving the offset as acceptable and some not? Why is this important? 
as in why is the social acceptability important, well, you may actually claim it's not important at all if the developer has got a license and approval to undertake the development. It's been signed off by all the relevant departments. Then presumably they can just go for it. But the issue is, is that if publicly there's a, an objection <coughs> to it, then you may actually see an adverse reaction to you. Even though you're saying, look, I've got all my approvals, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, socially you may run the risk that you're going to get into trouble. This, I this is the idea of this social license to operate. That, that socially you may not have got a license from the public, even though you've got a license from the relevant government department. So you, as, as a developer, you may actually be a bit worried if you're going to find people chained to the fences around, you know, on the gates of, the, of your development because they're objecting to the offset. So it's potentially important to think about it. So how do we do this? Well, we did a choice experiment, of course, and the idea of this to, eva to evaluate the way people responded to the offset attribute. So this is going to go out to the public, not to experts or scientists. It's going to go out to the public. And given these are hypothetical, we need to set up a context. So the context was, imagine there's a shore-based development on the Kimberley Coast in WA has a residual impact on the feeding grounds of a thousand muddy turnstones. So this is the residual impact we, which we need to fix. Muddy turnstones are a migratory bird and that immediately, as in all migratory birds, are on the list, on the national interest list. So that immediately would trigger. That's enough to trigger to say that the Commonwealth would come in and say, okay, let's have a look at this. Let's see what, whether, whether you, you, you have a residual impact and, and therefore let's see what you've done to mitigate it. So given that we're interested in people's attitudes and choices about this, we set up these, these choice um, sets. And this is starting off with just the example of, say, the first option that the developer might put up. And in this, what they do is they say they're going to protect the buddy turnstone. That's the species under um, impact. We're going to do something close to the development. I, we're going to do it in WA. And we have this issue about direct <coughs> and indirect or direct and compensatory measures as to how we actually achieve the, <coughs> the, the improvement or to achieve the no net loss. So direct actions are ones that are on ground. So that could be fencing off um, other beaches, um, protecting breeding grounds or whatever you might do. On ground stuff that actually protects the, 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 the matter of interest. The indirect ones are things which happen which are not on ground and there are things like education and research, where what you say is, I'm going to fund a research pro program at UWA, which is going to improve the understanding of, of the ecology of this species, and that will actually then achieve no net loss. So these are a bit fuzzy, these indirect ones. We're not actually doing something directly on the species. We're, we're doing something at arm's length. But here we've got a proposal coming in saying, well, 80% of the impact is going to be achieved by direct and 20% by indirect. And what we tell them is, we have been told by the scientists, the ecologists, that this will actually achieve no net loss. So we're not asking you to make judgments about the ecology. All of these proposals you're going to see have been signed off by the relevant ecologists to say that they will achieve the, the ecological outcome. <coughs> so we're not asking people to actually make judgments about ecology. We're asking them to make judgments about me method. And so that's a very turnstone. But we then offer them alternative options, options two and option three. These are other um, proposals that developers put up. And here you're starting to see the attributes that we're going to use, the attribute sets and the levels. So actually in options two and three, we're not actually protecting the muddy turnstone, we're protecting the eastern curlew. And the eastern curlew is actually an endangered species. The muddy turnstone isn't, but it's migratory, so it matters. But the eastern curlew is actually a, an endangered species. There's much smaller numbers of uh, birds. So if you came in and actually said, well, what we're going to do is protect this more endangered species as, as our offset, how would people react? Now this, what's happening over here are things which aren't actually currently allowed in the federal regulations. So we're pushing the definition of what's allowed to see how people react. The WA offset rules actually allowed you to possibly include non-impacted species as long as they were more endangered. So this is, was sort of being flagged as feasible in WA. Location, well, this one was next to the development, but in here we've moved away from the development. We've actually moved, into the second one, offshore, we've moved into China. This is a migratory bird, so potentially we can achieve an ecological improvement by actually going somewhere else in, there, in, the, fl in the flyway. And the ecologists actually were telling us, well, 
if you're going to do some actions, the place where you get most bang for your buck is actually in Asia. That's actually where the critical habitats are we should be protecting, so why not move offshore and head up into China, or possibly the Northern Territory, and also there's another one which is New Zealand. That doesn't turn up in this option, but we also have, so we have four locations. WA, China, Northern Territory, New Zealand. And then we can play with the proportions of direct and indirect. So option three, high levels of direct, not much. Uh, option two, 60, 40. The most we ever go to is 50, 50. And what we sort of expected was that people were gonna want to see more direct offsets. And it turns out in the marine context, that they actually, it's, it's actually quite difficult to actually get that percentage that high. So there's discussion in um, the ministry about in the department as to, as to whether or not they, they need to, to relax the current rule, which was 90-10, down to something more flexible towards the indirect. Um, and that's the use of uh, And we then have a the fourth option, which is simply no development. As in, you could just reject all this and say, I, th this is just so, such a bad idea. We, we just don't want any of this to happen at all. So they could potentially click the box and go for no development. We were a bit worried that everybody was going to head this direction. <laughs> uh, we, we had mechanisms to try to look at that, but we were worried about the no development problem. Just a clarification, so is there any context about the no development, like this no development means you lose 2,000 jobs? Yes, we, des we described what the size of the development was, but it was constant across all of the, all the stuff. One of the things you want to look at possibly is changing the loss that you would have in there. We didn't do it in this one. So, it's just, so they did have, in all the, 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 the prelim blurb, there were all the descriptions about how all this works and what the development was and so on. So they were given some context. So the sample went online. Um, it was only the Perth population. This was actually a pilot study for the biggest study that's happening later on this year. Those choice sets, there were actually 24 of those, efficient, S efficiency designed to actually get all the combinations of the attributes in the right orders, so we can actually identify things. It was blocked, so each respondent only answered six of them. And um, I'm overrunning my time already. Uh, and um, in terms of the opt-out, there actually wasn't a problem. Um, of the choices, only 11% were chosen, 77% never chose an opt-out, and only about 6% always chose an opt-out. So that was quite reassuring. So what do we do with this data, and how do we analyze it? Well, what we've used is something called the scale extended latent class model. So what that does is it allows the data to tell you what the different preferences are in the population. So we're not assuming that everybody in the sample has the same preferences. We're saying actually different people may value different things. We're not going to impose that ex ante. We'll let the data reveal that to us through the latent class model. And so what you're seeing here is our preferred model and it's showing uh, what it, it came up with four classes, four preference classes, and these are the attributes, whether or not we're protecting the eastern curlow, percentage direct, where it's located, WA is the baseline, and this is the opt-out option. And what, you can, what we've done is we've tried to simplify the model as much as possible to get a consistent set of, a most efficient set of, of um, parameters in there. And what immediately popped out was that there was one class who basically just opted out. That positive coefficient on the opt-out ASC means that these guys will always choose the opt-out option. They didn't care about any other attributes. Class two actually didn't like us protecting the Eastern Curlew. They didn't care about the percentage direct. They were averse to us moving into China and New Zealand equally, and the Northern Territory, but less so. And they actually didn't want to opt out. That big negative on there means they're not going to work. <coughs> Class three did prefer us moving and protecting the eastern curlew. So we were a bit surprised by this. The Hill people actually were actually positively saying, we'd rather you protect the eastern curlew. Um, they have the same issue about they want local, the, the offset to be local, but it's much stronger. As in China at minus 14, then New Zealand at minus 5, then the Northern Territory. So we're getting this really strong anti sort of distance effect and the opt-out, um, again, negative. And then class four, they didn't care about what species um, we protected, but they did care about the proportion of direct and indirect. So this is the only class that did care about 
proportion of direct. And they liked more direct, that's positive. They didn't like us moving out of WA, but they treated all other sites equally. And this positive coefficient on the opt out means they're actually prepared to trade off across the different um, choices that we're going to see. In terms of the proportions in the sample, small here, um, relatively evenly spread across the others. Sorry, did you say that this is Australia wide or just WA? WA. What we've also got is that we can model class membership. Can we identify who, the, which person is in which of these classes? And the only thing that we found that would actually explain that is what is, is some measures of the social license to operate. So as part of the survey, something which Claire did very well, was she actually had a, a part of the survey which tried to measure people's social, the estimate of their social license to operate for the oil and gas industry in WA. So we've got these, these measures, economic legitimacy and social legitimacy, and the, come back. the important one is that those are both negative which means that those people with high levels of social license to operate are less likely to be in class one. Or alternatively, those who've got a, so a low social license to operate, those who think that the, the oil and gas industry is a bit dodgy, are more likely to be down here in class one and reject the development as, as a whole. And this is the only variable that we could find to explain class membership. So, conclusions. We get this heterogeneity of attitudes towards offset. You can't treat everybody the same. There's big differences. This social license to operate, which was a bit speculative on our case in terms of doing that, actually is important, and it seems to behave in, to explain the type of person they are in terms of members of the classes. Only a small percentage reject the offsets, which we, we were surprised but relieved about. <laughs> that would have been, been really <laughs> problematic. There's this really strong, for those people who are accepting them, there's this really strong spatial pattern, as in you can generalise it by saying that everybody wants local and they don't like it moving either into Northern Territory or offshore to some degree or And there's relatively little concern about direct versus indirect offsets. And that really surprised us. We thought that people would actually be much more concerned saying we want on-ground action. And it may be that they were just convinced by us saying there's no all of these work. So we may have got that result by convincing them that all of these offsets achieve no net loss. Well, not too bad, but not in my target. <laughs> okay, so that, you've seen what the issue is, you've seen the approach, you've seen the conclusions. You might well have little idea how we've achieved them now, because I've skipped over lots of the technical stuff. So let's what I'm going to do now in the elaboration phase is just try to pull up some of the elements I think of what we want to talk about. So um, this is all driven by this scale extended latent class model and it's got these multiple elements to it. We get these four latent preference classes which is about the way people value the attributes. It's got this what's known as these scale classes as well and what the scale classes do are measures of the error variance, the degree of certainty that people have over their choices. <coughs> And it's possible that, we, that what the model allows is to say that there's some people who are quite precise and, and ordered in their choices, and there may be other groups who are much more random, much more uncertain, no, much less consistent in their choices. So this model allows us to have these different types of people, not just about preferences, but also about their scale or their variance. And we also had this neat thing of, of actually having this measures of social license to operate. And we built this off with Tia and Thompson, who had the original paper, and we've got another whole paper which actually reports how we did that. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about those three other elements as to how that of how the model works. So the first thing is the scale extended latent class model, and those of you familiar with with choice models should have been starting to wanting to jump up and down and shout at me because I was making statements about oh look this is a really big number minus 14 and that's much bigger than minus five and minus two. And strictly, you can't compare those numbers in those ways, because these are sort of unitless numbers. They're actually um, normalized marginal utilities, which don't have any real meaning. Um, the only meaning they can have is, is in relative terms. So I've got used to these, so I can interpret what's going on in this model, but basically you have to think about the relative values of the parameters across the different attributes, not the absolute numbers. 
So I was being a bit naughty in, in just doing my hand waving. And what people should have asked me is, well, where are the part words? Because these are the usual the measure of the relative rates of return between attributes in a choice experiment. How much am I willing to trade off one attribute for another? That's the standard metric in a choice experiment, usually in dollar values. Where are they in this model? They're nowhere in this model. One, we have no cost. We couldn't see how we could possibly ask people to pay for an offset when in some sense it's an obligation of the company to do it. So how can we have a financial payment? We can't do that. You, you didn't have any cost even for the, the options themselves. So potentially 80% direct and 20% direct they would be a completely different cost for whatever company. No, they were told that the developer that the cost for the same, for, for all the offsets cost the same for the company. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was neutralized. We could do it, if we had a continuous variable in the model, we could work out how they would, tra how they would trade off, say, an attribute like location against, say, the percentage of direct. And that's why we had this variable in here to some extent, was so that we could actually say, how much are you willing to trade off direct offsets against location as a continuous variable? Well, we could do that, that was really neat. Of course, the problem is, these little chappies, it's not significant in there. So we actually, for these two classes, we don't have a continuous variable in our model. So the idea of doing rate, marginal rates of transformation disappeared. So that gives us a problem of interpretation as to how we actually talk about this model. So what we did was we did something which I think is quite neat. We ran a thought experiment. And we took a particular class, preference class 2, which is that one there. And this is the one who ranks WA better than Northern Territory, better than North New Zealand, but New Zealand and China are the same, and they prefer to protect the value turnstone. So what we did was say, well, let's assume that we actually offered these people four offs offsets and an opt-out, which we can do. We've got a utility function. We can work this out. And what we're going to do is that each of the four um, offsets happens in a different place, China, New Zealand, Northern Territory, WA. And we're going to offer them the same species, the eastern curly, which is actually the one they don't like. So this is the worst species for this group, but it's the same across all of them and an opt-out. What would the probabilities look like? Well, this group would want to go for WA. 60% 60 of the people would, would choose the WA one. So you had a vote on that, the <coughs> WA offset, offset would, would win. So now we just rerun the thought experiment and say, let's change the offset in China to the ruddy turnstone. This is their preferred species. So we're giving them a good thing in a bad place going into China. Let's see how big a shift that can make in terms of their problems, in terms of their choices. So this is going to give us some idea of the relative weights that they place upon getting a good species, the ruddy turnstone, but in a bad place, China. They don't want to put the offsets in China. So what happens is the probabilities shift. China turns up to 24%, but WA is still the preferred outcome. We can do the same thing for Northern Territory. Now we're going to have a, a fourth set of these where the species protected, the ruddy turnstone, is in the Northern Territory. And they don't like the Northern Territory, but not as uh, much as um, China and New Zealand have that in there and actually now this option opt this um, offset option becomes the most preferred one so actually they're prepared to trade off to move out into the northern territory which is not preferred as long as they can get their preferred species so we're getting some sense of terms of the uh, strength of preferences and of course if we put the value terms on WA it's all good 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 that's the preferred location the preferred species we're definitely getting. So this is done, so when I was talking about, oh, they don't like China, whatever, really that was based upon uh, our understanding of what was happening in these probability tables, which are driven, driven by the parameters, but these are sort of much um, cleaner. We can do the same game, class three. These are the ones that have got that really strong preference ranking across the locations. If we put, the, they prefer to perfect the Eastern Curly, um, we put, Ready turn slowly in, so that's the worst one. Can you just clarify, sorry? So you take group, you take a subset, you take block three, and then a subset of block three, and you're only looking at them. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. This is just scale class one, scale class three, preference class three. 
by scale class one. By scale class one. And, and we'll that's ten percent of the sample. That's, that's ten twenty people. That's ten percent of the people, twenty people here. Probabilistically twenty people. What happens? Well, we go into WA, we put the best species into China, has absolutely no impact in terms of shifting what well it does, but at decimal points. So this is what I'm saying, God, that's a really large coefficient. They really don't like China in terms of moving the offset into China. That's what that's coming from. That's a really strong preference away from putting the offset into China. Put it into New Zealand, we're seeing some impact, because New Zealand is slightly better than putting it into China, but almost negligible. Put it into the Northern Territory, slightly better, but it's still not getting it. This group basically has got this really strong spatial preferences, almost lexiographic. <coughs> they, there's nothing you can do, basically, given the attributes, to induce them to accept this China option if you've got WA in the mix. Even though the WA one may not be a very good one. Notice also, we're not getting anything into the opt-out. As in these people, despite what we're doing, they're all just, none of those probabilities are turning up in the opt-out. Okay, this is class four probabilistically 8%. So these are the guys who um, prefer WA, but everywhere else is equal. And they don't care about the species, but they do prefer high levels of direct. So now we do the thought experiment, the four options, and we set um, it at 50%, which is the worst level of, of direct offset that we showed them. So this is, sort of like again, the worst possible set of offsets we could offer them. And what do they do? They'd rather not, they reject the development. Things are looking so bad for this, they'd not, rather not go anywhere. Um, put it into China, or no, put 100% put in China. So, no, so now this is all on ground, which they like. In a location, China, they don't. And it sucks some probability out of WA and some out of the opt-out, but still, they're basically telling us We'd rather than this thing didn't go ahead. Do it for WA, 100% in WA, and they're now prepared to actually accept the offset. So as long as we get the offset up to 100%, and it's in WA, they'll accept it. Otherwise, they'll reject it. So this, given this is a continuous variable, we can now ask the question, what's the break-even level of direct offset? It's 79%. It's if you've got a direct offset with 79%, got an offset with 79% direct in WA, they're indifferent between saying yes to the offset and going and, and rejecting the development. So anything bigger than, than 80%, 79% will get them the developer over the over the hump. Okay, now we have choices. I've got five minutes. Yes. Let's do scale classes really quickly. Scale classes, no, we're not. I'm going to do. Scale classes are important. It changes probabilities. Um, let's talk about social license drop rate, which I think is a, is a nicer thing to do. Um, so remember, we had this thing. We said the marginal effect of the social license drop rate changes class membership. So predicting which class we're going to put people in depends upon this idea of social license drop rate. I just hand wave social life, you know, we measured it, uh, trust us. Um, <laughs> what is this? Well, social life operates this idea of an implicit contract. Um, so it's an implicit contract between society and the developer, or stakeholders and the developer, and um, it's independent of whether or not they're legally they can do stuff. And companies want to keep this. You see now turning up people actually being quite positive. We need to have a social license <coughs> operate. Boutillier and Thompson suggested there was a hierarchy of social license drop rate, economic legitimacy, which you have to get first, and then these higher levels of socio political legitimacy, interactional trust, and institutionalized trust. And if you can get this, you're home and dry, as in this is the gold standard. If you can get, and basically this means that people think that the company and them are sort of as one. So you want to try to achieve this. But, and they, they claim, or the argument is, is that people, you can't get this without having these lower levels. There's this hierarchy. How do they do it? Well, they have these Likert questions, agree, disagree. 
we can gain from a relationship from, so they did this for mines. We can gain from a relationship with the mine and then on a green scale, one to five, I think, or one to six. We need to have cooperation of the mine to reach our most important goals. You can get people to answer these questions relative to the mine, particular mine they're doing. They have 15 of them, they do factor analysis. What pops out are four factors, and the factors are lined up. The first two come together, and they call that economic legitimacy. Those four come together, interactional trust, and so on. And then from the factor analysis, you can get a score as to how well you scored on your four factors. So they're using these to actually line these things up. I'm going to flag these two, five and seven. The presence of the mine is a benefit to us, turns up here and in the long term makes a contribution to well-being, turns up in here, and they're sort of happy with that, but these actually look a bit like economic ones. They're sort of quite similar to, we, we, um, we gain from the relationship. So, so these turning up in here, in these other ones, is a bit of an issue. So what do we do? Well, we can't use their wording because their wording is very specific to a mind site. So we, or Claire, did a translation from the original questions, the mind, that's what it says, into the compass in the oil and gas sector, do what they say they'll do in the media. So they're trying to, she's trying to generalize these specific ones to minds to a general question. So this is about people in Perth talking about oil and gas. So we've got 15 of those. So that's the original fact analysis, the 15 questions, how they all group up. We had our 15 questions, which map. And we did it both factor analysis, and we were really hoping we were going to get four nice groups which mapped up perfectly. Didn't happen. What we had was basically two factors drop out. The first one's economic legitimacy, but it also picked up those other five and seven, which are the ones which look like economic benefits. So we're sort of quite happy with that. And then everything else just basically clustered onto one, one factor. It couldn't differentiate. It wasn't able to separate out these different levels of trust, the difference between so on. So it was just, we've just got two measures of social license to operate. The lowest one, economic literacy, and what we just call social literacy. I think everything about it. And so, that, so those two variables, the factor analysis is what we're using in our model to all to explain membership of the classes. And when we, so we score them and we get the factors and we normalize them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Economic on that one, social on that one, 45 degree line going through the middle, and what they're, they're suggesting is that it's unlikely to see people giving higher scores for social legitimacy than they do for economic. I, you need to get economic, a high score for economic, before you you'll get it for social. So we were when that popped out, we were quite pleased because most people are turning up above the line. They are, their score for economic is higher than their score for legitimacy. There's a few people say this one. Someone here who's giving, who's getting higher scores for social than they are for, um, for economic, but um, that looks pretty good to us. So we've used that. Those are the variables that we're using in to explain um, to explain the, so the, the, the the class membership. And we had no idea. This was really. Let's see what happens. Let's try to make this measure, which nobody's done before, in this generic way. Let's use it and see whether or not we can actually use it to explain behaviour in these choice experiments. And it seemed to work. Okay, that's we done. Thank you. Shall we do any questions Yeah. That you told me I had to finish it after thirty five minutes. Well, I'm just confusing if you format. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one I really stopped. So I'm, I'm pleased after having seen a, a few iterations of, of this presentation now. Is it getting better? I've now, I've, it's getting much clearer, and I now feel like I can, I can ask some intelligent questions about it. Um, so one of the things that, that I was wondering about is, you know, you were talking earlier about the direct and indirect offsets. And I was wondering, you know, earlier you had talked about the, um, you know, the social license to operate versus uh, the uh, ecological there was yeah, the, the ecologically, w this being questioned. Do, do offsets yeah, Actually, make ecological yeah. sense? Yeah. And one of the questions that I had is, has there been much work looking at the social acceptability of indirect offsets versus the ecological acceptability of indirect offsets? No. Okay. I don't. Um, 
there, there, there are people who question the people who question whether or not these actually will work, and they, yeah. the, the questions are even larger for the for the indirect ones. Yeah. Yeah. Does giving a grant to study turtle nesting, whatever, in for actually WA, actually have an impact on? And how can you be really sure that the five million you've given for that program is really going to achieve? Yeah. So there's questions about whether there, but but nobody's, and I suppose there is expressions of concern about the indirect. So I think when the po offset policy was up for public discussion, um, was it WWF in their public submission came out quite strongly and said under no circumstances should you allow indirect offsets to turn up in offsets policy. They're not really offsets. This is a way of getting ar around things. I think that's sort of a summary of what they were saying. Um, so, th so those a NGO type people are expressing concerns about it. So that's the level I suppose you could say there's expressions of concern. But in terms of academic work, right, right. trying to get into it, no. Okay. And then the other question that I had on sort of related to that is, um, you know, you talked about the, the distance effect and wondering not only about the distance effect, but if um, if you could look at uh, time and temporal preferences as part of that as well, and wondering if the uh, indirect offsets are act as sort of a proxy for temporal preferences, um, you know, putting off mitigation to a later date. So we um, so time is a really important thing in the offset literature in the sense that um, so some actions. The government would rather you have the offset in place before you do the development. Sure. So if you're going to rip out seagrass, you, rather than having that, you know, 20 years to get it, or whatever it is to get it re-established, you could have it sitting there beforehand. That's actually quite. That doesn't actually require that actually, but to go ahead, you just need a program in place. But people, that's part of the ecological concern about the temporal timing of it. Um, don't know. I mean, which one, which one is likely to deliver a faster impact? As in the, the indirect or the direct? I mean, I don't, I mean, you might, you could even argue that the indirect might deliver things faster. Because if we can just, fix, if we can work out how to manage this now, we can do lots of stuff, not just for this here, but you know, generically, we could do lots of stuff quickly. The other thing is say, well, it's a five year research project. Who knows what's going to come out at the end of five years? I mean, nothing may come out at the end of five years, which is useful to improve the management. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I was going to say it's, it's ecological nonsense, the basis of offsets, and this might be for people who are ecologically ignorant and whether they knew what a decent curve or a ready term stone was, can sell the idea that the financial system somehow is a proper surrogate of how the world works. Now, people haven't asked these questions, but there's examples in Western Australia where you might say this similar thought processes went ahead and we got to destinations we would not have chosen in the first place because they are 50 or 100 years down the track. And seeing you're in the agricultural economics thing, salinisation of the wheat belt of Western Australia is all the basic information of why this would happen started from this department in 1913 with the yeah. foundation professor and people took no notice of it. But we've got so many hundreds of thousands of hectares of salinised land that everyone in the financial industry, like the bankers, has taken their profit elsewhere. But we've got the problem. We've got other things with endangered species in the metropolitan area here now where forestry has replaced woodlands with other things which yeah. happened, because you mentioned Martin Maron's paper there, and their colleagues of mine also on that where pines turn out to be something that carnivores cockatoos, if you wait for 20 years, can beat that mast source instead of banksia cones. But ultimately, your pine plantations have gone. You've taken them up. We've got, we've got very few of any of these species left. Now, at the federal level, we're selling the other thing at the moment about industry does not cost, um, if you like, disperse, you know, costs on the community and people think that this will work. It's a bit like a yeast thing, everyone likes it, or most people like a beer, but there'll be some that don't think it, is if you think of a culture of yeast, 
to produce alcohol, they eventually kill themselves. Hmm? Yeah, so I think the issue about um, whether the offsets underlying it work or uh, whether the offsets will, will actually ecologically work, I think is a valid one in terms of whether or not those systems can, will, can work. Um, so there are people, so that's not a judgment that terms of what we're doing here. That's not a judgment. No, the, 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 uh, people's this, preferences, buy, yes. Buy this crop. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, but we're, we're not interested in. We're, we're not interested in selling a crop. We're interested in. In so we haven't got. Uh, no, no. You're interested. So we're interested in about the, the understand the, the process. process now, so the question about whether or not they understand. So we, in terms of doing the survey, quite explicitly tried to 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 make that statement that the ecologists have said that protecting this beach. 200, you know, 100 kilometers up from the development, improving that, removing people, whatever, will achieve an improvement in that species as compared to. So, so what we so rather than saying it's, we're, we're trying to, we have to set for these for this to work. We want to have everybody, if, we, if possible, on the same page in terms of understanding. So, we tried quite hard to make that statement that. The, don't try to make judgments about the ecology. So we don't want to have mixed up in this preference set people making judgments about the ecology. Because otherwise then we've got to try to unpick. What are we unpicking? Their understanding about the ecology or their preferences towards different mechanisms and trust about people's delivery of the offset. So we have to do that. Otherwise we can't... Um, otherwise we don't know what we're getting. So we're Now the question is whether or not we achieve that or not. So if you had picked up the survey, you would have been answering this, saying, I don't believe what they're saying in this part, and would have been answering on a different basis to other people. So that we may have some of that element in, inside here, but it is about, really, it is about trying to control for that, making the assertion, and then having control for that, understand preferences. So that that is the way we do it without prejudging to say actually we think that we've been doing a whole stack of this the marine offset stuff for, for in within the NERF and the, the 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 answer seems to be coming quite clearly from everybody is we really don't think that you can do marine offsets ecologically we are really uh, so so that's quite a strong that that view is out there and we're. That's one of the interesting policy well, processes. Well, off offsets in the broad type. I declare, look, I, I'm a graduate of UWA Agriculture, but I've been working in this space for part of Western Australia for a long time in ecology. Marine things are one thing I tried to engage the oil industry on long ago, including places like Morgan, where they knew the information that they totally ignored that bonk in their current development, apart from it being there. But there's current debate, you see, about whether this whole idea of Give a card of his cockatoo a bank account and everything will be all right. You're not giving them a bank account. No, you're no, you're giving them an alternative, an alternative area of, of of feed and habitat or whatever. Yeah, but as Martin paper point out, if you clear the bush and you, then you say we'll go somewhere else, they don't necessarily yeah, you do need it. To, yeah, yeah. Logic. This is why the migratory birds one. Yeah, and there's a lot of debates. See, like the UK is having this debate at the moment. And there was some more stuff on the radio last weekend, a few more papers, but we were probably just sort of picking this up. And it's like in this, like Richard Holmes is just up the road here. Or my, my sort of analogue with this is you go into an art gallery, say, there, and you think about the ecology, like picking threads from the Bay Area Tapestry. You know, we don't need that thread, we don't need those ones. Or as Richard says, the cruder one is you go to the gallery and say, well, that Mona Lisa, we don't need that one now. <laughs> Chuck it out. I'll paint you something similar to it later on. Yeah. So these these are in fact uh, not sums that work. No, no, no. I, uh, yeah, I think I agree. I, I would agree with the ecological question. Right. Yeah, so we'll just leave it there. We're nearly finished. Okay. So thanks very much, Mark, for a great presentation. I'd just like to remind everyone that next week's seminar is by Jennifer.